Good evening Thanks. and good evening, everyone. The Dodgers are ready, and so is Los Angeles. Apparently, what could be the game of the year is about to begin, and we'll have a live report. Plus, exclusive details on a drug sting to end them all. U.S. Customs agents swooping down on the world's seventh biggest privately owned bank. Colleen Williams. Jess Morrow. Fritz Coleman Weather. Fred Rogan. Sports. And David Sheehan. Entertainment. Channel 4 News, number one in Southern California. Good evening. In just a few minutes now, the Dodgers and the Mets will square off in Game 6 of the National League Championship Series. If the Dodgers win tonight, they're in the World Series. As you might expect, rush hour traffic leading into Dodger Stadium is a mess. Hundreds of fans are stuck in their cars right now, hoping to make it to their seats in time for starting pitcher Tim Leary's first pitch. Chances are they're not going to make it. But if the Dodgers pull off their amazing comeback and put away the Mets, no one will remember the hassles of getting into tonight's game. Colleen? Meantime, as you might expect, there's uh, plenty of Dodger mania a little closer to the field. Our own Dodger maniac, Fred Rogan, is standing outside the ballpark with a live report. Fred? All right, Colleen and Jess, we're out here at Dodger Stadium. One time, go. Yeah! Let's go, Fred! All right, all right, okay, all right, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. Time out. Up. Oh, oh, you. All right, of course, the big question tonight, is Kirk Gibson going to play for the Dodgers or isn't he going to play? Well, Kirk Gibson is penciled into the lineup card. He's in the familiar number three spot. He took batting practice before the ball game, and Tommy Lasorda says if anybody is able to play with an injury, it's Kirk Gibson. Here are his thoughts. Well, he's in there taking batting practice now. All I'm hoping is that he'll be able to go out and play tonight. If anybody can do it, it's him. All right. Tommy Lasorda says that Gibson will be in the lineup. Gibson says he'll be in the lineup, but I'll guarantee you one thing. None of these maniacs will be in the lineup. Back to you in the studio. I'm getting out of here. Bye. All right, Fred. We'll get back to Fred in just a few minutes. In the meantime, there's alarming evidence tonight that the war against Los Angeles street gangs may not be going as well as believed. New LAPD statistics show a sharp, sharp turnaround from last month's report that said gang-related killings had decreased. The new figures show a more than 12% increase in gang-related killings in the city in only the first nine months of this year. Police Chief Darrell Gates has ordered his department to analyze how it keeps track of gang crimes in case this increase is actually just a statistical problem. Another tragic case in point of how serious the gang problem really is. Another shooting today, and the victim was a 14-year-old boy. It happened in front of a school playground. Police say the boy apparently knew his assailants who opened fire as he approached their car. He and the operator of the vehicle flashed gang signs back and forth to one another. The operator beckons him to come to the vehicle. As he's approaching the vehicle, he sees a handgun in the car, flees. As he's fleeing, the driver of the vehicle fires several shots at him. Doctors say the 14-year-old was shot above the right eye, but they say he will survive. Police found the car believed used in the shooting, but thus far they have not found the suspects. A former Los Angeles police officer has been convicted in the contract killing of a Northridge businessman. After a week of deliberations, Richard uh, Ford was found guilty of murdering Thomas Weed. Ford was also found guilty of special circumstances for which he could face death in the gas chamber. The penalty phase of his trial will begin October 31st. The trial of his co-defendant in this case, Robert Von Vias, is still underway. And two brothers and two of the hitmen they're accused of hiring for murder have been ordered to stand trial once again here in Los Angeles. The brothers, Neil and Stuart Woodman, allegedly hired two men to murder their parents at home in Brentwood three years ago. The four face murder and conspiracy charges in the case. They are scheduled for arraignment October 17th and could face the death penalty. Yes. Two men accused in the contract killing of a Hollywood producer have been ordered back to court. William Mincer of Canoga Park and Robert Lowe of Rockville, Maryland are two of four defendants charged with the murder of Roy Radine, who disappeared in May 1983. His body was found one month later. Radine was a millionaire promoter. He came to Hollywood to produce movies. He was believed involved in a cocaine dealing operation. Today, Lowe and Mentzer were ordered back to court on November 7th. At that time, a date for a preliminary hearing will be set. A 35-year-old Long Beach mother is in jail today, booked for setting fire to a Long Beach abortion clinic. The arrest came last night after arson investigators combed through the burned-out rubble of the Long Beach Women's Family Planning Center. 
Shannon Taylor is accused of pouring a flammable liquid through the clinic's front door mail slot Sunday night and then lighting a match causing $50,000 damage. She is also accused of starting a minor fire at the clinic in June. Investigators say Taylor had previously picketed the abortion clinic. We now have an update on that brush fire southeast of Corona. It is still burning at this hour, but it is under control. It's consumed at least 600 acres of heavy brush, 250 firefighters with the California Department of Forestry and the U.S. Forest Service are battling this fire. Earlier, the fire threatened some very expensive ranch-type homes near I-15, which is about 10 miles southwest of Corona. But five air tankers and two helicopters and 25 engine companies kept the flames away from the homes, and that fire is now burning in remote areas of the canyon. Politics coming up next. The focus shifts to the Los Angeles debate. You'll see how that shapes up. Also, hundreds of AIDS activists arrested when they lay siege to the agency in charge of AIDS research. The Pope comes face to face with a Protestant activist from Northern Ireland who tells the pontiff what's on his mind. And we'll report exclusive details on an elaborate international drug sting. Customs agents snare one of the world's biggest banks. That's on the Channel 4 News at 5. Whatever your problem, you are not alone. Self-help groups help. In California, call 1-800-222-LINK. Just a reminder that every week you'll find something entertaining in TV Guide. It's on sale now. All frames are now on sale at the optical department at Sears. You can save 15 to 50% off any frame when you buy lenses at regular price. Hurry, sale ends soon. Yeah, cattle roundups just aren't what they used to be. These days, you gotta pamper beef. Black Angus is now serving prime rib at its best. Now we got this fancy high-class beef. Slowly roasted and served traditional or mushroom smothered. You gotta wait on pan and hoof. Our prime rib dinner, just $8.95 at Black Angus. Okay, who had the tossed alfalfa? You already knew that you pay a lot less at C&R than at other stores. What you probably didn't know is that at C&R, you actually get a lot more. Because when you buy at C&R, and you lose a button, or break a zipper, or gain or lose a little weight, any normal alteration, C&R will fix it free. Forever. C&R. Because you deserve more. Democratic presidential candidate Michael Dukakis will arrive in Los Angeles tonight to prepare for his Thursday debate with Republican George Bush. Before flying west, Dukakis unveiled a program he says will restore U.S. leadership in science and technology. During his speech at Tufts University, he also got in a dig at Bush. George Bush is satisfied with today and complacent about tomorrow. The Republican campaign song seems to be, don't worry, be happy. As we said, Dukakis arrives in Los Angeles tonight. He'll be making a couple of campaign appearances here tomorrow before that debate on Thursday. Meantime, Republican George Bush will also arrive here in Los Angeles tonight. During a stop in Seattle, he promised to crack down on white-collar crime. Vice presidential nominee Dan Quayle, meantime, was in the Midwest, kidding Dukakis for not being there. I bet old Mike Dukakis doesn't want to come here to Napoleon. The reason he won't want to come to Napoleon is he doesn't want to meet his Waterloo any sooner than he has to. Quayle took a bus tour of rural Ohio today and got very good receptions at every stop. He did not react to polls saying he was a drag on the GOP ticket. While quail stumps in the Midwest this week, Bush will be here in Southern California until Saturday. One of the big issues in that campaign continues to be crime. The Bush quail campaign focusing on a prison furlough program in Massachusetts and the role Governor Dukakis played in that program. Now Dukakis has come up with a reply to the charges leveled against him as our political editor Linda Douglas reports from the newsroom. Linda? 
Well, it is a rather unlikely issue for a, pres a presidential campaign. That is the issue of prison furloughs. George Bush is the one who brought it up. It still plays a major role in the give and take of the candidates. Bush is accusing Dukakis of uh, sponsoring a program that released prisoners on killers on furlough. But now Dukakis is fighting back, and he must, because the polls show that the furlough issue is hurting him. As Governor Michael Dukakis vetoed mandatory sentences for drug dealers, he vetoed the death penalty. His revolving door prison policy gave weekend furloughs to first-degree murderers not eligible for parole. George Bush has been running these ads for weeks now, criticizing a Massachusetts program which allowed first-degree murderers out on furlough. Bush points to the case of Willie Horton, who tortured and raped a couple while on a furlough. Dukakis has tried to argue that he discontinued the furlough program for first-degree murderers and says many other states have such a program. Today, he pointed out former California governor Ronald Reagan presided over a furlough program with tragic results, and he argued Bush knows that. He knows that President Reagan, when he was governor of California, had a very extensive furlough program, which unfortunately and tragically ended in the murder of a police officer and a school teacher who were murdered by inmates that had been furloughed under that program. When Reagan was governor, two people were murdered by furloughed prisoners, an L.A. police officer in 1971 and a teacher in 1972. After the 1971 murder, Reagan defended the furlough program, saying, California is leading the nation in rehabilitation, but you obviously can't be perfect. Some legislators fought to exempt murderers from the furlough program, but Republican State Senator Bill Richardson said, quote, Ronald Reagan didn't do squat, unquote. In 1972, murderers were dropped from the furlough program, though there's no record of Reagan's having taken a position. However, corrections officials point out California's program was different from Massachusetts. Under California's program, all prisoners were eligible, but only if they were six months away from parole. Massachusetts furloughed prisoners without the possibility of parole. And under the California program, prisoners were on a work program strictly supervised throughout the day. The Dukakis campaign also argues that the federal government routinely releases tens of thousands of prisoners on a furlough program, 7,000 of those drug offenders. However, the Dukakis uh, response apparently has not yet connected with the voters because the polls do show that the crime and furlough issue are still hurting Dukakis. Michael Dukakis, as you said, is in uh, Los Angeles tomorrow, and as we've just learned from his campaign, he has apparently canceled all campaign appearances to begin preparing for Thursday's debate. Back to you. All right, Linda, thank you. And he's not the only one preparing. Final touches are being put on Pauley Pavilion for Thursday evening's presidential debate. That's when the famed house that Wooden built becomes an arena of political destiny. Saul Halpert reports the final debate will also include a very important first. Pauley Pavilion at UCLA, best known as the home court of the powerful Bruin basketball dynasty. Now Pauley is being transformed into a giant TV studio for the staging of the second presidential campaign debate. The last chance for Vice President George Bush and Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis to confront each other before Election Day. Yes, the the other one. Crews hired by the Bipartisan Commission on Presidential Debates are working overtime to prepare Pauley for the historic event. The Shrine Auditorium was originally scheduled to be the debate site, under the sponsorship of the League of Women Voters. But the League pulled out in protest against the format which prevents direct interaction between the candidates. We have no intention of becoming an accessory to the hoodwinking of the American public. Pauley can seat more than 10,000 spectators for basketball, concerts, and other events. But for Thursday's debate, it will accommodate only 1,200 people. The debate commission is in charge of ticket distribution and has allocated one-third to the Democrats and one-third to the Republicans. The commission will hand out the remaining third, and some will go to donors who've contributed to the $600,000 fund needed to stage the debate. That fund is still about $100,000 short. Some UCLA students, including a couple of political science majors, wish they could be a part of the live audience. The tickets aren't just generally given out to the student body at the ticket office like for other special events. You think they should have been? I would have liked it. Well, Pauley Pavilion's been the site of a lot of great events, and uh, I think this can be one of the best events uh, in UCLA history. Bernard Shaw of Cable News will be the moderator on Thursday. He'll be joined by an all-women panel, a historic first. Andrea Mitchell of NBC, Ann Compton of ABC, and Margaret Warner of Newsweek. Thursday's second and final debate is crucial to the Democratic nominee's hopes of recapturing the initiative in the battle for the White House. 
Obviously, it's of equal importance to Vice President Bush, who doesn't want Dukakis to gain that advantage. Saul Halpert, Channel 4 News, Westwood. Is one of the world's biggest banks dealing in drug money? Exclusive details on an international drug sting operation next. Plus the huge haul of cocaine in Los Angeles County. It's all coming up next. I want all Medicare beneficiaries to know you have a choice of Medicare health plans. Write Options Medicare, Baltimore, Maryland, 21207. The Home Club Challenge, September 28th. National Lumber sells the Intermatic Wall Switch Timer for $15.99, a good price. September 29th, Builders Emporium beats National Lumber by 6%. Home Depot is 12% lower. But every day, Home Club non-members save over 28% on the exact same item. And Home Club members save even more, proving once again that at the Home Club, you save on everything, every day. Black. The store is Stroud's. The best money can buy for a lot less money. It's Phil and Jim's annual warehouse sale now. Every store has a warehouse just loaded with TV, video, stereo, and appliance savings. Like this Whirlpool 18-foot deluxe no-frost refrigerator with adjustable glass shelves, meat keeper, twin crispers, dairy bar, and automatic ice maker ready at $5.99.88. Or this 10 power level microwave with four-stage program memory cooking and quick defrost cycle at $159.88. Low prices, selection, and service. Try us. It's love of... I need to be taken care of. And leave them. I didn't know. I See, I'm just like the public. On the next entertainment tonight, those Hollywood love affairs that sizzle, then fizzle. Sly Stallone, Brigitte Nielsen, Paul Hogan, Lionel Richie, Rob Lowe, Melissa Gilbert. The stars put down the crying towels and tell the inside stories of your cheating heart on entertainment tonight. Federal authorities announced today that an international drug-related money laundering ring has been shattered. The case involves one of the world's biggest banks, and there is also a Southern California connection. Patrick Healy has the story. Authorities say the money came from South American cocaine, lots of it. This batch seized in Philadelphia was hidden in anchovy cans. The indictment contends the money laundering was based at the Miami branch of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, chartered in Europe and rated the world's seventh largest international banking institution. Its officers include Amjouat Awan, personal banker of Panamanian strongman Manuel Noriega, accused but never prosecuted for drug dealing. The indictment unsealed in Florida names 85 defendants. But what is really important here is that we have indicted an international financial institution. Some of the accused were arrested when they showed up at a bogus bachelor party set up in Florida by the FBI as part of a sting. Pasadena is home for two of the accused international drug dealers and money launderers, Roberto and Gloria Alcano. She was arrested Saturday here in Los Angeles. He was arrested last month on a cocaine case in New York. Customs agents have seized the Alcano home, secluded behind shrubs and a gate in the expensive hills above Pasadena's Rose Bowl. Federal agents also seized an apartment project that is under construction on Alcano property south of MacArthur Park. The government contends the construction is illegally financed with drug money. Since I've known them, they've been in the jewelry business, both retail and wholesale. And that's the extent of my knowledge. What other involvement they have, I do not know. The indictment contends the Alcanos funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars to be laundered by contacts in Miami. Authorities searched the Miami branch of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, also the branch in London where one of the accused took part. The bank also has an agency in downtown Los Angeles. No federal action was taken here to prevent the bank's opening. Local bank executives brushed aside questions about the indictment. I cannot say anything. Please do not waste our time. Can you leave? Patrick Healy, Channel 4 News, downtown Los Angeles. More details tonight about that major cocaine smuggling ring believed put out of business over the weekend. 1,600 pounds of cocaine with a street value of about $222 million were confiscated. The bust also produced more than $550,000 in cash and a variety of weapons. 
Eight Colombian nationals were arrested in connection with that ring, but federal and state authorities agree anti-drug statutes still are not tough enough. And unless and until we are able to have a significant impact on the user, on the demand, on the appetite for drugs, then whatever we mete out in the way of punishment, it's not going to solve the drug problem in this country. Sheriff Block was awarded the money under a federal program for an earlier drug bust, and he said today he is planning to use it to beef up his department's anti-drug efforts. Colleen? Minority discrimination continues to weigh heavy on the Los Angeles Police Department, with 18% of the force Hispanic, a figure that is growing. Problems of promotion still exist. Elizabeth Anderson reports that one former officer and other prominent members of the Hispanic community today took up that issue with the police commission. Ernie Valdez is a former LAPD officer. He had an exemplary record, complete with a star of valor. But none of this, he complained, seemed to matter to the department. And I always thought that with hard work and, uh, and dedication that you can get ahead on this department, and that's not the case. You tried to get ahead. You let them know yes. that you wanted to be promoted. Yes. Valdez says he's just one example of an LAPD system that discriminates against Hispanics. Independent and department studies seem to back that up. Figures show that last year no Hispanics were promoted to lieutenant. Over the past two years, less than 1% of the Hispanic officers ever made it to sergeant. Valdez has filed a $1 million lawsuit, the first of its kind, against the LAPD. He does this okay. even though the police commission says there have been significant improvements. For example, Hispanic recruitment is way up, but problems still exist. The Organized Crime Intelligence Division only employs one black officer. Less than 2% of its complement and only five Hispanics less than 10 percent of its complement in this division. And the frustration level has reached a point where we did file with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing representing the 500 officers and all other impacted Hispanics in the department. Today, commission members vow to take an even tougher stand to expedite promotions among Hispanics. Valdez says he'll believe it when he sees it. Many Hispanics feel the timing is just right for legal action. For example, they point to a recent lawsuit by Hispanic employees of the FBI. They charge discrimination and the court agreed. Valdez feels that is bound to favor his lawsuit and any others that come along. Elizabeth Anderson, Channel 4 News at Parker Center. It'll be a while, but the voters in Orange County are going to get to decide whether all future county jails ought to be located in Santa Ana. That proposition is backed by a group that wants to keep a jail out of the cold Gypsum Canyon area. Supporters say all the lockups ought to be built in Santa Ana because that's the seat of county government. The initiative will not be on the ballot until 1990. All right, here's a question for you. Just how cool is cool? Weather-wise. Fritz, no. <laughs> Fritz is, spells it out. Uh, concerning our weather coming up next. We're picking up an unidentified ship, sir. Yeah? I hear music, people laughing. But only one specializes in continuous soft hits. Coast 103 at 103.5. Coast 103 updates you quickly in the morning and plays plenty of great music. The best songs to take with you while driving to work and great music to keep you company in the office. It's the one station everyone can agree on. So coast through your workday with Coast 103 and continuous soft hits. My friends were right about Europe. It's definitely more fun than clients. TWA means Rome. Leaves the real estate today. Demands sales and marketing sophistication. Careful analysis and fair value. Trust and confidence anchored in professionalism. And widespread recognition through advertising of a well-trained core. We call the force. Red carpet. Every advantage in the market and growing. Okay, go out and hug your weather, man. This was a <laughs> terrific day. What Please, a great do day. Do that. A little... A little uh, now warm still but uh, autumn haze nice exactly a little little uh, warm here in the valleys the coast has cooled off nicely tomorrow will drop three or four degrees and i think just be perfect here in the valleys of course with the return of cooler temperatures we also see haze being a little thicker in the afternoon and dense coastal fog tonight it looks like the north coast will get the thickest of the fog from zuma malibu all the way up to about santa barbara last night it was the other end san diego got some very dense 
fog to about five miles inland. But uh, uh, good weather, very comfortable. Outside today, Santa Monica. Captain Bob got a picture of our uh, marine layer for us, flew right through it. And uh, it has returned. That's good. That means the exact opposite of the Santa Ana that blasted us over the weekend has occurred. These numbers at 5 o'clock. Folks, good day for pennant winning. 75. Now the barometric pressure is at 29.94. Humidity, 58%. Winds are out of the west at 10. We had a high today of 80 and a low 65. Well, people just can't understand how they got together in the first place. It was doomed from the start. These two had no business being in the same room as the other. Are we talking about Mike Tyson and Robin Givens? No, it's news, light, and journalism. It's a big talk <laughs> throughout the coast. Just a couple of quick notes today. A local rock band in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, is holding a benefit concert for Bruce Springsteen on October 29th. It's called Bucks for Bruce, to raise money for Bruce's as yet to be determined divorce settlement. It's because <laughs> he only made $61 million in the last two years, and some of his fans feel like he needs some help. Finally, the least important piece of information you're going to learn today. A worldwide network of 400 computers has cracked the largest number ever. They found the two factors of a 100-digit number. I'll tell you what that means. One 41-digit number multiplied against a 60-digit number made a 100-digit number. Now, what does that mean? It could be bad news for banks, because banks use large numbers like that as security systems in their computers. They didn't think it was humanly possible to do that. So if you get a large group of hackers together, you pretty well got first interstate covered, if you really want to put that together. But a 100-digit number, isn't that phenomenal? I, I can tell I've dazzled the anchors here. Boy, are they excited about that. We want to see it on a check. I know. <laughs> there you go. Well, maybe. Anyway, around the country, lots of fair weather today, but early winter has arrived along the eastern Great Lakes. Matter of fact, snow today in the Marquette, Michigan area. It started to be about an inch and was laying nicely in the ground. Then afternoon temperatures warmed up into the mid-50s and blew it right out of there. But an early taste of winter. Sleet in Indiana and the Fort Wayne and South Bend areas. Elsewhere on the eastern side of the Great Lakes around Ontario and Erie, a light rain up throughout New York State and Pennsylvania. We had light rain showers and some snow at the higher elevations of the High Sierra, also in western Montana. Nothing sticking there, but just it looks like fall has definitely arrived. Look at the daytime high temperature map. Upper 40 and low 50 degree temps in the northeastern part of the country. Ohio and Tennessee Valley over into the northern Appalachians and southern New England states. And overnights tonight, they're going to get frost and freeze warnings again with temperatures for several hours being below 30. Out west, fairly normal. For us, the cooling trend continues. We had a very strong, rocky, mountain high pressure area over the weekend that gave us this offshore flow, the Santa Ana, dry and up above 90 degrees. And dusty winds in the mountains and deserts. Well, the reverse of that is now uh, uh, happening. The onshore flow, the cooling sea breeze, because a low coming out of the Gulf of Alaska, that's fairly typical for winter. And that means we've got cooler temperatures. We'll drop five or six more degrees here in the valley. Uh, coastal fog could be more dense. And tonight, as I say, from, say, Zuma, Malibu, north to Santa Barbara, the most dense of the fog. And then uh, haze lingering in the afternoon sun. But much cooler, much more comfortable. And I think a great weekend, too. Uh, low 60s for overnight lows in the valleys, 60 at the coast, 58 in the city of Orange, 61 in the inland counties. Daytime highs tomorrow, mid-80s throughout the valleys, 87 in Arcadia, upper 60s at the coast, 82 in Thousand Oaks, about 90 in the Riverside, San Bernardino area. Boating and surf, three feet everywhere, little change expected. Winds are out of the southwest at 10 to 15 knots, two-foot seas and a swell southwest at three feet with partial afternoon clearing. Forecast tonight will be fair inland, but there will be dense coastal fog in uh, local areas, low 62. And then tomorrow, hazy sun with a high of 82. And for the rest of the week, will be around 80 degrees with morning clouds and fog and hazy afternoon sun. That's about normal. That's about five degrees above normal for this time of year, but pretty comfortable. Yeah. Got it. It's hard to believe we have to worry about this kind of story now, but I guess if you drive into the mountains, you should. If you're planning on driving in cooler climates this winter, you might want to stock up on antifreeze now. Experts say the price of antifreeze is going to double to about $13 a gallon. And that's because a key ingredient, ethylene, is being gobbled up by makers of polyester and videotapes. Although antifreeze is going to cost a lot more, don't worry. If you can pay $13 a gallon for it, there should be plenty to go around. A speech by the Pope is disrupted by a famous protester from Northern Ireland. We'll see how that goes in a moment. And hundreds of arrests as AIDS activists take on the federal government. We have a great breakfast at the International House of Pancakes restaurants. I'll have the Rudy Tootie. 
The Rudy Tootie fresh and fruity breakfast. Uh, I'll have the Rudy Tootie. Two eggs, two bacon, two sausage, two fruit top pancakes, strawberry, blueberry, peach, or cinnamon apple. People just love the breakfast. I'll have the Rudy Tootie. They just take the name. The International House of Pancakes Rudy Tootie Fresh and Fruity Special, just two ninety nine. There are some things you shouldn't start your day without. This is today in L.A. Good morning. It's six thirty, and things are warming up. Some we're hitting good company. <laughs> now looking ahead to some things happening today in L.A. The, the latest information. We've got an increase in clouds, and that means yes, a chance of rain again today. We're gonna if lie. your commute puts you onto the San Diego freeway, it's a real mess. Let's get and the today in now. L.A. That's our news. Thanks for watching. The Today Show is up next. Mornings at 6.30 on Channel 4. Our telecopter is over downtown Los Angeles where we are getting a shocking story that smoke is pouring now from the main library downtown. This is the library that just, what, three years ago suffered heavy, heavy damage because of a major fire. You can see that smoke pouring out there now. They tell us that's from a fourth floor window and it seems to be confined to that one area. You know, they still haven't recovered from that fire three years ago. In fact, just recently I saw commercials on television asking for financial help because of uh, some of the books still damaged from that fire. As you can see, a lot of smoke coming out of that, that area. A lot of firefighters on the scene, we're told, uh, trying to contain what appears to be a fire, a good-sized fire at the uh, downtown main library. One of the big problems with the damage before was all the water-soaked books. Those books, many of them were frozen so that they could be freeze-dried and, and uh, saved uh, by that technology. They're probably very careful that uh, the sprinklers don't do more damage than uh, might otherwise. And of course, what we heard last fire. time, too, many of those books are one of a kind sure. in that library there. Yeah. We'll keep you posted on Bad that news. story. In the meantime, hundreds of demonstrators, many of them dying of AIDS, blocked entrances to the Food and Drug Administration's headquarters in Maryland today. They were demanding easier access to experimental drugs for people with AIDS. 175 people were arrested today, and NBC's Robert Brazell has the story. It's a lie! It's a shame! The protesters had many complaints, all based on the contention that the FDA could do more for people infected with the AIDS virus. I'm real mad. I don't think they're doing enough. People are dying. This is an emergency. It's a war. Let's treat it like a war. I believe that people who may be dying have a right to drugs that may save their lives. So far, AZT is the only treatment approved for AIDS. It is not a cure. In medical centers across the country, researchers are testing drugs as possible new AIDS treatments. So far, with little success. The agency responsible for getting the drugs out is the Food and Drug Administration, and if the drugs aren't coming out, that's the logical point at which to direct one's hostility. But I think, in all fairness, there are not many new drugs coming to the FDA. Dexter for sale. You can get it out here on the sidewalk, but you can't get it inside. At today's demonstration, people were selling drugs as AIDS treatments, which are not approved by the FDA. Such illegal sales have been going on for years. Most doctors and scientists say the FDA's role is crucial, that drugs should be proved effective before they are sold legally. One can understand, really, the, the sense of desperation and frustration that patients have, but one needs to be concerned that people are not, number one, making their immune system more vulnerable to the viral infection, and number two, not being taken advantage of financially by people who are out there to, to prey on desperate people. The demonstrators burn an effigy of President Reagan. FDA officials insist that whatever the administration's policies have been about AIDS, if there is a good treatment for AIDS, they will get it to patients as quickly as possible. Robert Bazell, NBC News, New York. In France today, Pope John Paul was unexpectedly interrupted during a speech he was making to the European Parliament. The incident occurred just as the Pope was beginning his address. He was interrupted by the Reverend Ian Paisley, a militant North Ireland Protestant leader. Permit me to say how much I... and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, for the second time, Mr. Paisley, 
I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. Paisley decried the Pope as the Antichrist. The Pope remained calm throughout the incident. Moments later, Paisley was escorted from the chamber. Pope continued, finished his speech, a speech that called for a common political structure in Europe. Federal officials promised today to implement new safety procedures at nuclear plants which supply weapons material. As NBC's Robert Hager reports, the announcement came as new concerns were raised about security at top-secret nuclear laboratories. The federal government said today it will order the main plutonium processing facility at its Rocky Flats, Colorado nuclear weapons plant to remain shut down three to four weeks because of safety concerns. This after it confirmed that two people there tested positive for exposure to radiation, although the accident was not said to be life-threatening. And the government announced a very slow, cautious timetable for restarting three reactors at the Savannah River, South Carolina, plutonium and tritium production plant, shut down because of safety. The first reactor won't be restarted until December or January at earliest. The others won't be turned on until next summer. Department of Energy Undersecretary Joseph Salgado told reporters all the nation's nuclear weapons plants are aging. I anticipate further problems within the safety arena. You have to remember that these facilities at Savannah River are 34 years old and many of our facilities maybe outdate a lot of people in this room. So there will be problems. Whether there's shutdowns or not, I don't know. Some are worried that the military could run out of nuclear materials, especially tritium, crucial to nuclear warheads if problems do persist. The government doesn't believe it'll come to that, but acknowledges it's concerned. Again, under Secretary Salgado. This is not a short-term issue. Those reactors at Savannah River need to function for another 10 to 12 years before a new production reactor comes online. And to make matters worse, a congressional report charged today that security may have been compromised at some of the government's most sensitive atomic laboratories. The report charges the Los Alamos and Sandia weapons laboratories in New Mexico and the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in California permitted visits by 118 communist officials without required background checks, and that at least three foreign visitors to the labs may have been spies. The Energy Department's Richard Duval was questioned by Senator John Glenn. You must have known for quite some period of time that was going on. Why didn't you stop that? That's just against all your own regulations. I can't tell you that it stopped, Mr. Chairman. I can tell you that, that a lot of people are working a lot harder to make sure it doesn't happen. Government officials claim what the foreigners saw at the labs was unclassified. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. A New York demolition company and four, four of its former supervisors today pleaded guilty to violating federal clean air laws. Clouds of cancer causing asbestos were sent into the air when the uh, now bankrupt wrecking company demolished part of the Kaiser steel plant in Fontana between 1983 and 1986. All four supervisors face a maximum three-year prison sentence for failing to notify the EPA of those violations. State authorities raided a small company in Fontana today where they said they found hazardous waste violations. Investigators spent the day searching the Four Stars Container Company. They discovered 82 drums of waste that were improperly stored or inadequately labeled. Co-owner Michael Young denies any criminal intent. He says it's just a lack of experience in the business. We are not criminals. We have never borne any criminal intent. Uh, there was never any danger to the community, any danger to any, any person. Uh, this waste was contained. Young says he'll be seeking a 90-day extension. Give him time to get that operation in proper order. A victory today for owners of homes and small apartment buildings. The Los Angeles City Council has decided to allow small property owners to self-certify that they have installed water-saving devices in their toilets and showers. That means they will not have to pay for a city inspector to prowl their bathrooms to verify installation. However, when the property is sold, an official inspection of water-saving devices will be required. It was an uphill struggle on Wall Street today, and in spite of a late rally, the market still lost a few bucks. Down 16 points in early trading, the Dow chipped away all day, but had to settle for a loss of 2.5 points at the closing bell. An average share of Common lost 4 cents. Volume totaled 141 million shares. Right now, our Fred Rogan is live at Dodger Stadium, where the Dodgers are so close, they are only one win away from the World Series. We'll have all that excitement, plus, does this cameraman get the picture? You'll find out next. Here I got a whole box of Kellogg's Raisin Squares. No salt, no fat. So is that why I'm eating them? No, I gotta eat them because they taste great. The old sale is in its second price-shattering week. 
with spectacular values like the spacious curved sectional for just $699.98, a savings of $300. Or for only $199.98, choose either a complete entertainment center or this beautiful family size five-piece dinette set. No payments or finance charges till next February with a Wix charge. Quality made affordable by Wix Furniture. You know the freeways are filled with people who have car insurance problems. But as you probably know by now... Insurance, it's no problem. Chick Hearn on the road for public insurance. All right, time for sports. Let's go to Fred, who's out of Dodger Stadium. All right, Jess and Colleen, Mets and Dodgers underway in Game 6. If the Dodgers win it tonight, they are headed to the World Series for the first time in seven years. The last National League West club to reach the World Series, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Mets made some changes tonight. Lenny Dykstra starts in center field in place of Mookie Wilson. Kevin Elster gets the college shortstop, and apparently it pays off for the Mets in the first inning as they tag Tim Lurie for one run. Kevin McReynolds, a sacrifice fly to right field, and the Mets grab a 1-0 lead over the Dodgers in the top of the first. It's the first time the Mets have led in this LCS. As for tickets here at Dodger Stadium tonight, it's the toughest ticket in town. Brett Lewis was out in the parking lot trying to find some a little while ago. We're selling field box tickets. Anybody got tickets? We're selling field box tickets. I need tickets. Anybody got any extra tickets? I mean, there's people who have seats, but they're like, some of them are $100, $200 a seat. So they're asking for that kind of money? Yeah. What are you willing to pay? I'd be willing to pay 40 yeah, it's worth it. I mean, this is going to be the best game of the year. What, what do you think you're going to have to pay for them? Uh, at least face value. At least face value? Yeah. But maybe more? Uh, I'm not paying more. You're not? No. <laughs> no. It's against every principle I, I've ever had. What do you think the most uh, people will get for tickets today? They better start getting face value pretty quick because as soon as that they hear him start inside, they're just, it's over. Hey, Sammy, you would be the ultimate ticket scalper. I know you've got the good seats. You're planning on selling those, you're gonna use them. Are you joking? <laughs> My wife would kill me if I sold these tickets. But Sammy, you could get a pretty penny for them. Well, I, I'm, I'm not into jewelry anymore, so what would I do with the money? <laughs> He doesn't need the guilt. He's going to the game tonight. Sammy Davis here at the ball game. Again, the Mets are leading 1-0. They're still hitting in the top half of the first. Greg Jeffries at the plate. Basketball, something that had been talked about for some time, becomes a reality today. The Houston Rockets acquire big man Otis Thorpe from the Sacramento Kings. In return, they give up Rodney McRae and Jim Peterson. Is there a problem with Larry Bird? Let's go to the basketball court back east where the Boston Celtics are holding their training camp. Bird reported to camp, but he wants a new deal, and he was asked if he would go free agent in two years. I never go free agent, Sam. I, I'd probably quit before I did that. You know, I, I think if it came down to that, I, I've said before I might, but you know, if I really sit down and think about it, there's no way. I'd play my two years and just get out of it. If I play an extra year or, or two years, it'd be with the Celtics, unless they trade me. I'll give them everything I got while I have it, and uh, I think that I got a few years left in me, and, and hopefully we can get together and win some championships. Larry Bird wants more money, but says he'll remain a Celtic as long as they'll have him. Dodgers now have activity in their bullpen as Tim Larry is in trouble in the top half of the first inning. NFL notes the Jim Lachey deal is finally completed. You know, the Raiders acquired Jim Lachey, then sent him to Washington. In return, the Raiders now give Napoleon McCallum the running back out of Navy for the San Diego Chargers, and the deal is complete. What an outstanding effort last night by Randall Cunningham to the Philadelphia Eagles as he took on the New York Giants. Let's go to Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia and show you Randall Cunningham in action. He's the quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles wearing number 12 and watch this move against Carl Banks of the Giants. Banks chased him down to the side. Cunningham would not be denied here. Kept his footing although Banks hit a good shot. Cunningham stays up. His knee never hit and whipped the ball to Jimmy Giles for a touchdown. Banks could not believe it while the Eagles were celebrating. They won it 23 to 14 a big win for the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, we're going to show you our Rack Focus Award now. You don't get to see many of these. It was quite a shot. For that, let's go to Glendale College. It comes to us from the football game between Santa Ana and Loyola. It's American Cable shooting the game. Here is the running back sweeping to the outside. Watch very closely the cameraman, Ken Simpkins, of American Cable. Ken Simpkins paying the price as he's run over. But as any good photographer will tell you, get the picture. Ken got the picture and hung in there. Nice effort. Back here at Dodger Stadium, it's the Dodgers and the New York Mets, and Mickey Hatcher just came within inches 
of tracking down a foul ball, so the Mets are still hitting. They're leading one nothing, and we'll keep you updated on the score. See you in about an hour. Back to you, Jess and Kali. All right, Fred, can you hear us? Pardon me? Can you hear me? I can you, hear you. You said the bullpen is warming up. Is that Oral Hershiser again? Hershiser is not warming up in the bullpen yet. The right-hander is Brian Holton out there, but don't count Oral out. He could go out there if they need him. All right, thanks, Fred. An American ship carrying the yacht used by New Zealand in the America's Cup race has just been seized by a Cuban gunboat. Eight Americans are on that supply ship, the Tampa Seahorse. They were taken to a Cuban port after a confrontation about 12 miles off the southeastern tip of Cuba. The ship's agent says no shots have been fired during the incident. The Tampa Seahorse, which is based in New Orleans, is carrying the New Zealand yacht from Long Beach to New York City. It is the end of the road for a local club appealing a discrimination ruling. We have details ahead on that. Plus, the two challengers for Los Angeles County Supervisor meet face to face. Get ready for something you've never tasted before. New fresh and natural brand premium pasteurized R. Because you deserve more. We're now getting what we believe is good news from that fire in the library downtown. Let's go to our helicopter view. You can still see some smoke pouring from it, but we are assured that the fire was in construction material in the basement of the library, and the smoke just wafted upward. No indication of any fire in other portions of the building, and the color of that smoke would suggest it probably has not uh, had a lot of water on it. The sprinkler system probably was not set off as a result of that. It is, if all that is true, good news from the downtown library, fire plagued in recent years. Turning now to local politics, today Supervisor, County Supervisor Mike Antonovich debated the man who wants his job. It all happened on cable television, and Jim Giggins has a story. The two candidates met for their first televised debate in this election at the studios of Century Cable in Santa Monica. From the very beginning, the charges and countercharges began flying. Do you have one instance in which you've increased the density on behalf of a developer in which you didn't receive a contribution? We don't check to see who's contributed to a campaign before we vote on an issue. We vote on an issue on its merits, and that's the responsible thing to do. Polls show that development in the 5th Supervisorial District is the major campaign issue. Many residents in the unincorporated areas of the San Fernando, San Gabriel, and Antelope Valleys believe there's been too much of it which is the reason the subject came up so often during today's debate. I'd like to know your philosophy, Mike Antonovich, on growth and development within the 5th District. I believe in planned, responsible growth. We do have to provide housing for our people, and we can protect the environment. If I were fortunate enough to be elected, 15 minutes after being sworn in, I would review all of the land use applications for the 5th District. The candidates also differed on a controversial AIDS proposal that was recently presented to the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Should the county um, encourage the dispensing of clean needles and condoms? I believe so, and bleach kits or whatever else is required. They say it would cost about six million dollars to give out needles and bleach. We have a hundred thousand drug addicts, sixty bucks per person. I would rather take the six million dollars and put it into drug rehabilitation. There are no more televised debates scheduled for the two candidates, though Ward and Antonovich will debate at least three more times at events sponsored by community organizations. Jim Giggins, Channel 4 News, Santa Monica. A blow to the exclusive and some say discriminating Jonathan Club, the Supreme Court of the United States has refused to review an appellate ruling that allows the State Coastal Commission to impose a non-discrimination clause on the club. The Jonathan Club had sought a permit to expand its beach facilities in Santa Monica. The Coastal Commission held a hearing and found the club discriminates against, among others, blacks, discriminates to the point of having rejected Mayor Tom Bradley for an honorary membership. A report out today from the National Research Council says older drivers are more likely to be in deadly traffic accidents than the average driver. The report says the solution is not to force the elderly off the highways, but to improve licensing and highway standards. Drivers over the age of 75 are second only to teenagers in the number of fatal accidents per mile driven. 
Right now, our Kelly Lang is up in the newsroom. She has a look at what's coming up on the news at 6. Kelly? Right to our Colleen and Jess. Well, needless to say, the Dodgers could become national champs tonight and get in the World Series for the first time since 1981. So we will have a live report from Dodger Stadium on exactly that. Other news, a 14-year-old was shot while walking to school today in apparent gang attack. This on a day when new LAPD statistics show a big jump in gang violence. We'll have that story at 6 as well. And our money editor, Doug Kriegel, reports that tonight in Washington, the Senate is debating a measure that would protect taxpayers from the IRS. That was just a few of the stories. And, Jess, you're going to hang in for the 6 o'clock news, and I will see you then in just a few minutes. All right, Kelly. Okay. Funeral services were held in Beverly Hills today for Billy Daniels, the show business legend for whom the old black magic was a musical trademark. Uh, under that old black magic called love. Ooh, under that old Billy Daniels' 1946 version of the classic sold 12 million copies. He died on Friday following a struggle with stomach cancer. Some of the biggest names in entertainment came to pay their respects August 3rd was the last time Billy Daniels heard an ovation. I think he deserves one now. Billy Daniels was 73 years old. Burial services will be held tomorrow. If the king of rock and roll were alive today, he would be a grandfather very soon. Lisa Marie Presley, Elvis's only child, is expecting a baby. The 20-year-old uh, Presley was married last week to 23-year-old musician Danny Keough. The announcement was made by the mother of the bride, Priscilla Presley, who said the baby is expected sometime next spring. A piece of Los Angeles history gets a new lease on life and for a good cause as well. We have that story and more coming up. When an alcoholic doesn't get help, it has a definite impact on his family. Call Care Unit. If you don't call, we can't help. Starting Friday, get a Big Mac or Quarter Pounder with cheese combo for the divine price of just $1.99 at McDonald's. If you consider the importance of energy in the universe, you'll realize we're a pretty smart crew here on Earth. Those who switch to the new generation of gas appliances they are dependable, efficient, and they do not cost you a fortune to run. You've got to be from another planet not to use gas. I, I always knew there was intelligent life out there. Now when you buy a pair of prescription lenses at our regular price, you can get something fashionable to keep them in at a sale price. The Optical Department at Montgomery Ward. Finally this evening, the city has paid tribute today to corporations that have pumped private dollars into efforts to revitalize the inner city. And it drew attention to a fading landmark which will be restored to some of its former luster. We got that story from John Marshall. She ain't what she used to be, but at least the historic Dunbar Hotel does have a new lease on life. The 72-unit apartment project is one of the first low-income housing projects funded by the California Equity Fund. In today's ceremony next to the hotel, city officials praised the private contributors to the fund and gave them original bricks from the hotel. In return for tax breaks, major corporations have pumped $15 million into the fund to help finance redevelopment projects in the state, such as the restoration of the Dunbar. What she used to be was one of L.A.'s finest hotels. The Dunbar was built in the late 20s by a black dentist after he was refused lodging at other Los Angeles hotels. Within a few years, it became the hotel in the city's black community. Those who stayed here were as famous as those who played in the Dunbar's nightclub upstairs. Lionel Hampton, Art Tatum, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Nat Cole, and Ella Fitzgerald. What does 77-year-old Lucene Stewart, who saw them all, Think of the Dunbar becoming an apartment project. I, just, I wish it would go back to really uh, what they started it to be, a historical landmark and have a nice museum here. But I do have mixed emotions about it. The bronze plaque on the corner of the building will remain when the apartment units open in January. It attests the Dunbar is Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monument number 131, an edifice, it says, dedicated to the memory and dignity of black achievement. That apparently will never change. 
John Marshall, Channel 4 News, South Central Los Angeles. And that's our news at 5. Thanks for watching. Keith is off this evening, so Jess continues with Kelly for the Channel 4 News at 6. Have a good evening. Good night.